Hello, my name is Donovan Bigelow, and this is parts three and four of my lectures on child development. The title of the book that most of this material uh, is from is called On the Bringing Up of Children. It's edited by John Rickman, the first chapter, and he also writes the preface to it, which I will cover. The first chapter is by an analyst named Ella Freeman Sharp, and the second chapter, part four of the lecture series, will be by Melanie Klein, a chapter called Weaning. Now, I have to apologize up front because in this material, pro uh, more than any other I lecture on, I'm going to be doing a fair amount of quoting. I thought that was important because this material seems so important and the word choice is so important that I want to get it exactly right and I don't think I can summarize it any better than these fine authors have laid it down. So I know it's not the most efficient or effective pedagogical technique to read <clears throat> in, uh, as a lecturer, but uh, this material is really important and I hope you pay attention. If uh, I lose your interest, go back and listen to the quotes again. They really are worthwhile. They're worth spending a great deal of time with. Um, in addition, I will spend a great deal of time in these lectures going over the specifics, the nuts and bolts, the issues that arise inevitably in all child development. Now having said that, it's also very clear to me that these issues evoke a great deal of conflict. They evoke anxiety and sometimes fear and sometimes anger on the part of parents who either have done things differently, who don't believe that uh, what they're hearing is the best way to do it, who feel somehow attacked or blamed or judged if they do it differently. Um, and my only advice to you on this is just be aware of your reaction to this material. Over and over again in child development, the lesson of the last 60 years of infant observation and child development research is that the, the affective, emotional presence of the parents is really one of the central ideas. If this material evokes great emotion in you, then that's interesting. We should be curious about it and try to help frame the issue, not in whether you agree, disagree, or are frustrated by this material, but whether or not this material helps you become a better parent. And that frequently is going to require that we sort of step back and take a look, uh, take a look that take a look that science requires us to take if we're going to do the best job we can by our children. One of the assumptions underlying all of this child developmental material is that child development is not bound by culture. That there is not just a lot of different cultural ways of doing it and they're all relatively fine. That simply isn't true. At least that's the perspective of child development now. We see that we have a biological bedrock, that we have a genetic evolved structure, and it's unfolding developmentally is inevitably the same. We're all human all over the planet. We do live in a lot of different cultures, but we're all human. And as child development goes, the unfolding of that genetic potential unfolds in exactly the same way everywhere. What is critical is whether or not the particular cultural norms of child development meet those developmental needs adequately. Some do better than others, some do quite well, and some, frankly, cause a great deal of difficulty for the children. It's our job to take a look at, again, what science shows to be the best possible developmental milieu for the children. That's the underlying assumption here, the, the main one. What's good for the children? Not, not what's good for me, what's good for the mother, what's good for the father, what's appropriate culturally in any given culture. The, at the end of the day, the only important question in, in my sometimes not so humble opinion is what's good for the children. If the answer is this seems to be good for the children, then that's what should be done, regardless of whether or not anyone's culture or bias or tradition or prejudice says something else. <clears throat> and that's why this course, probably more than any other, generates, generates such heated debate. This is personal. It can't not be personal. Most of you listening to this are either parents now or about to be parents or looking forward to be parents. Certainly we've all been children and been treated in particular ways. So it's hard to imagine, perhaps besides the sexuality lectures, um, any topic that's going to evoke more personal contact with your mind, your unconscious, your psyche, and your experience than this material. So I, I beg your forgiveness if, uh, if anyone's offended and challenge you to take a good close look at the material. All right. Basic assumption. Darwin and Freud changed what it means to be a child. That 
the effect of Darwin's theories on the development of children, and I think Freud's as well, I think Freud really put a cap on Darwin's theories in this particular point, that children aren't simply replicas, mere replicas of their parents, that they are persons with potential growth of their own. They have their own unique genetic evolving character that has to be fostered. The question, a more subtle question perhaps for parents, when will your child be allowed to be who they are, to become the little person that they are? If the parents can respect the child's budding personhood, if that's a word, then the child's overwhelmingly more likely to be raised to a happy, healthy adulthood. So children aren't mere replicas. They aren't little clones of us. We can't program them to be just like us. This is very painful uh, knowledge for some people. Um, one more point on the question of the tradition versus science. This is, I think we can put this to rest fairly quickly. Um, I think at the end of the day, it goes to different assumptions about the truth. People in traditional societies and people in our society who have their own traditions, traditions are universal, we often th think of them as embodying a truth, and they might to some degree. The problem in child development is traditional approaches very frequently do not have the ability to change. They do not accumulate new data. They do not have any breakthroughs in terms of, of science or scientific method or research. Tradition is tradition. We do it that way because it's always been done that way. That in some ways is anathema. That d doesn't work in child development. Over the last hundred years, starting with Freud's 1905 great text, uh, Three Essays on Sexuality, which was really a lot about child development, the entire uh, industry, the child development literature, is about continuing changes. And I suspect that if I give this lecture again in five or ten years, it will be dramatically different. The research continues, and great bits of research done in the 20s, 30s, and 40s remains profoundly relevant because of the, f the fundamental biological nature of this unfolding. It hap it's happening now with children now, but it happened in exactly the same way biologically decades ago. So things that people learned 100 years ago, 50 years ago, remain vitally important for us to, to keep access to. So we want to be careful about tradition, and I think this is this is the way I think about it. We all understand the phrase common sense. Well, that's just common sense. Caveat. To the extent common sense is developed out of respect and a derivative of science and respect for reality, the way things really are, then common sense is, it should be followed. But if common sense reflects a tradition whose only merit is that it's been done a long time, it may be nothing more than prejudice. It may be pathology. One has to ask the underlying question. Does that tradition align with science? Does that tradition align with a type of common sense that really is the result of folk wisdom, of, of, of junior scientists or mother scientists who watch their babies carefully and do what's good for the babies? And there have always been those kind of mothers and fathers in traditional societies. So I want to be careful. I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't want to throw out tradition. And here's the, the complicated part. I am not a slave to science. There have been numerous examples in the last 50 or 60 years of so-called scientists claiming the latest breakthrough in child development. And very quickly, their so-called researchers have, researches have been shown to be quite damaging. So we have to be we have to be careful, slow, and balanced. Just because someone has a PhD after the name and they slap a, my scientific research label on their conclusions doesn't mean it is. Just because someone says they're doing what they're doing because that's the way it's always been done, that doesn't mean it's bad. So at the end of the day, the question remains, what's good for the children? What I think we've accomplished with this material is respect for what the scientific method has shown children really do need, and uh, this has been a struggle that's been going on for over a hundred years. Um, 
the first assumption that got shattered in the scientific research of child development was that children aren't simple creatures. That a child's mind is an immensely complex thing. That we have constantly underestimated the cognitive functioning of children going back to infancy. We have constantly underestimated the perception abilities of children. The, the, the brain function, the neurological complexity of children's brains, not to mention their minds, has been, I, I think, on almost a decade-by-decade -decade basis shown to be more complex, more sophisticated than, uh, than we've given it credit for. To the point where just uh, a few months ago there was a uh, well, I guess it was a year ago now, 2011, Time Magazine read, had a cover article called The First Nine Months, I think I referenced it in the previous lecture, that talked about the primacy and the, uh, of the interuterine period from conception to birth. The idea, the, the, the sort of shocking um, take-home lesson from that article was that there is a mind, a functioning brain, a complex neurological matrix in the fetus's brain at some point at three or four or five, certainly by five months, into gestation. So we're now not just looking at child development, we're looking at baby development, we're looking at prenatal development as a formative stage of human development. Um, I don't think we can get much farther back than conception, but we'll see what the research shows. Um, we have to be careful, uh, a, a couple of cautions, because, as I said to begin with, this is a subject that raises great anxiety, great hope, and I think, unfortunately, sometimes great enthusiasms. Now, I like enthusiasm. I'm an enthusiastic uh, instructor, I'm an enthusiastic psychotherapist, but I think, I think misguided enthusiasts have caused a great deal of harm in child devel development theory. I don't want to present material that simply reflects the latest fad. That's not what this material is. This is grounded in writing 70 plus years old at this point. So, um, the other caution is that well brought up children will never be trouble free. I think there's been a passionate, enthusiastic desire for parents to figure out a way to take all the pain away from their children. I think parents instinctively want to make it right by their children. They don't want them to suffer, they don't want them to feel anxiety or pain, and it's an understandable, possibly even a noble feeling. It simply is impossible. And one of the researchers, Melanie Klein, probably as much or more than anyone, who studied dozens and hundreds of, of infants and babies very closely for many decades, came to the startling conclusion that babies, infants even, have very complex minds with lots of very intense emotions, and those emotions are incredibly aggressive, even violent, involving dynamics and feelings that we must call sexual at some level. And this is very disturbing for people. They, they, they don't want to see their little uh, bundle of joy. They, uh, and imagine that in their little tiny minds that they're feeling incredibly intense and very powerful and frankly very dangerous feelings. And the simple truth is, from birth and probably before, a baby's mind is not just immensely complicated, it is also riven with very intense emotions that most adults are not comfortable with themselves. And the idea that they, these intense and very uncomfortable emotions might be swarming around inside their baby's minds is a very disturbing thought. That it's true doesn't make it any less disturbing, and that it's true ought to, it seems to be true given the last 70 years of research, uh, requires that we take a deep breath and overcome our own reluctance to imagine these things because if we don't understand our children, if we don't understand what's really going on inside their minds, then we cannot do what's good for them. We cannot meet their needs. If a child does have intense anger, fear, anxiety, if they are sort of driven by physiological erotic impulses at some primitive, primitive level, and we deny that, we pretend it isn't true, then that isn't the child's reality and we will not respond to them in a way that fosters their growth and development toward health and happiness. 
third or fourth major change in child development. The really important factor in upbringing is the general attitude of the parents and the way in which the ordinary details of life are conducted. I think this is profound and fundamental. Let me make sure it's clear for you. Most, when my patients come in, and if they've got trouble, if they've got issues, if they've, if they've got defenses that are making their life difficult, if they're in denial, if they have anxiety or depression, they very frequently, because I think this is what pop psychology, this is what the media has taught them is right, they try to figure out some trauma in their life. There must have been a trauma somewhere, and if they don't have a trauma, they sometimes though they, they tend to want to almost make one up, or they grab on to some little thing and make it a big thing. And the truth is, this phrase, which we'll come back to in several variations throughout this material, the really important factor in upbringing is the general attitude of the parents and the way in which the ordinary details of life are conducted. It is the day-to-day -day atmosphere in the home, day after day, week after week, month and year after year. What is the emotional context of the parents' minds? That is what overwhelmingly is important in the mind of the child and in that child's taking in what it needs for its own development. We have to understand what the par parents are doing in terms of not just what their intentions are, but what they're doing, how that reflects their own unconscious, dynamic developmental issues themselves, how they frequently, how we all frequently as parents reflect the patterns that got laid down in our childhood. And if that's a good thing, fine, but if it isn't, we have to draw a line and say, this is the way I was treated. I see perhaps now that it isn't the best. Let me try a way that's been shown to be better. The old saying, I think, comes to mind, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We can have all the good intentions in the world, but if it isn't backed up with a deep understanding of the reality of the child's unconscious mind and developmental dynamics, we will not do our children or ourselves any good. A brief example, the question of good manners. Every parent wants their child to have good manners, and they frequently go to some extremes to ensure their children act accordingly, especially in public. A quote from the preface, the acquisition of good manners is not always rapid, and they are not always well-founded if too quickly acquired. The capacity to make good contact with other people and retain an easy relation with them is more important than the capacity to imitate their behavior. In no case is this good contact of more importance than in the relation between the parent and the child. It enables the child to build up a strong and flexible personality, independent and self-reliant, but retaining an affection for the older generation which will add depth and warmth to the welcome which awaits a yet younger one. I think that what that means, and I mean, that's poetry. That's just beautiful. But what it means is compliance and obedience in a child is not the critical thing. What matters is the easy relation to the parents. Is there something that almost instinctively through the parent's own maturity, gets transferred to the child in a way that makes them better people in private and in public. Mindless submission to or obedience to harshly imposed rules is not the same thing as good manners, which ought to flow out of a rich, varied, and mature character. Um, number five or number six in terms of the major changes is the role of the father. And I think I mentioned this last time as well, but let me, let me repeat. Freud's great prejudice, and he, like all of us, had them, was privileging the father. It was the Victorian era. It was an age that we might fairly call patriarchal. And his research led him, not surprisingly, to privilege the role of the father. He was also male. Melanie Klein, and even Anna Freud, Freud's daughter, were both in the 20s and 30s and 40s deeply immersed in the development, in child development studies, much more so than Freud himself ever was. Anna Freud and Melanie Klein actually worked with babies, toddlers, and infants uh, their entire professional careers. They knew more about children than, than Father Freud did. And clearly, in Melanie Klein's case, the privilege rather quickly shifted from the father to the mother 
And you hear very little about the father in, in many of Melanie Klein's writings. And I think that started a trend where the pendulum swung. The pendulum swung rather dramatically up through the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, it seemed rare to, to look at literature that, that, that uh, even mentioned the father's role, much less privileged it. So uh, I think this is where we are now, perhaps, is in a place where that pendulum can swing back in the middle, where science ought, ought to keep it, that the balanced understanding of the mother's role and the father's role seems to be necessary. And I think this quote is one of the best I've read on the role of the father. And again, role of the father to the child, the child's interests. Quote, the child always pictures himself as vis-a-vis -vis both his father and mother. The triangular relationship may or may not be harmonious in these fantasies, but it is never, even in orphans, a concept of mother and son, mother and daughter, without some trace of a father figure. Children need to see the interplay of personality of father and mother, male and female, for their social imagination is far more active than is generally realized, and they are helped by observing the friendliness of one sex to the other. If the father and mother are at loggerheads in conflict, it will be hard for the child to envisage a satisfaction with satisfaction the founding of a home of his own, whereas the experience of a congenial home fosters the desire to produce a similar one for oneself. He needs to see the considerate behavior of his parents to one another, their good humor in the face of vexation, their camaraderie and a mutual loyalty, for by these observations the child is strengthened in a belief that he can overcome his own jealous, jealousies and aggression, his inconsiderateness, ill humor, and perfidiousness. Fancy word for, sometimes, evil, which the authors understand, I think, as natural aggression. So Klein's ultimate idea was that there is what we call a combined parental object. That means, and this, this is also a, a profound sort of transformation, it is impossible to tell in any adult what characterological traits that they have. You put all the characterological traits together, put all their personality traits together, and it's simply not possible to go back uh, developmentally to see which of them they got from the mother and which of them they got from the father or whoever else was in their lives. It's not possible. The human mind is too complicated. The accumulation of a developmental experience is too interwoven with both parents to be able to cleanly tease apart a particular adult character trait and tie it back to one parent. There's no blaming the mother and there's no blaming the father for any one particular thing. And you've all heard this. I've seen it in television shows and movies. Some mother, irritated by her son, will say to the father, Father, your son is doing this, that, or the other thing. You know, as if she disowns the child because that behavior clearly is too much like the father. Not justified. Not justified at all. The child's impression of the parents is in some ways profoundly equal it makes some sense biologically in terms of evolution, in terms of biology, that if we come from both parents, and both parents historically, traditionally, have been involved in the raising of the child, then it would make some sense that the mind of the child would be an, a mix of both genders, both parents, and this does get complicated in our modern society, and I'll address that perhaps later. But in the child's mind, the role of the father, in accordance with most of the modern research, remains a central developmental impact. And it's not just general. The father's, and I think I touched on this last time as well, the father helps the child in different ways. By first containing the mother and allowing the mother to focus the incredible energy and attention necessary for the child's mind to be contained, that is the mother's early primarily role, primary role, the father also has an independent relationship from the child from day one, which also fosters the child's growth. And more specifically, the child will see the male energy, which is different from maternal energy. The father's presence often excites the child. The father's male energy in some ways evokes in the child a desire to move away from mother. This is a perfectly normal and many folks think necessary developmental step. Back to the key point. 
It is the atmosphere in the home between the parents that determines whether the child's disposition to the outside world is friendly or hostile. Now, I think this is central because is the child trusting or are they suspicious? Are they outgoing or are they introverted? It appears that that primarily is determined by whether their experience in the household between the parents is one wherein they have taken in the love and trust between the parents. That love and trust shown between the parents translates into a sense of the self in the child as capable, as strong, and trust, therefore, again, is an achievement of a healthy developmental environment. There's lots of technical words for how this happens. Identification, internalization, introjection. I'm not sure the, the jargon matters. What matters is the key idea that the fundamental building blocks of the child's mind is, is inevitably re represented by the larger structure of the parental attitudes toward the child, toward each other, toward the family unit itself, all of that is what is taken in into the child's mind. Here's another quote from, from Rickman. Parental instinct is not enough. It may be nothing more than prejudice or pathology. The main prerequisite for, the parent, for parenting is the parent's own mental health, which is determined by their developmental history. No amount of thinking can take the place of love. And if the emotional attitude is not right, if the parent's abilities to truly love is compromised, then that has to be addressed first. I get this all the time. I have individual patients or couples come in and at some point, if they have children, and usually very quickly, sometimes halfway through the first session, they want help with a particular behavior that, that their child, sometimes very young child, sometimes teenage uh, young adult, is doing. And without exception, the answer inever, invariably is, how is it that this behavior came about in the house that you've constructed? It goes back to the parental atmosphere. And you cannot fix the behavior of a child and then put them back in the home atmosphere that generated the behavior to begin with. Child development and therapy of children, and I think adolescence as well, requires the intervention in the entire family system. If you don't intervene in the family system, you cannot fix the child. Parents who want the therapist to fix the child are in for a great deal of frustration, as is the child. So, both the love between the parents and to the child are taken in and are necessary. I think that's the take-home lesson. Okay. Uh, that's the preface, uh, the introductory material by uh, Rickman. Planning for Stability is the name of the first chapter by Ella Freeman Sharp. Um, and she, she thinks it's important, and I agree, to, to talk again about some preliminaries. The greatest contribution of psychoanalysis is the possibility of greater self-knowledge, knowledge of the hidden self and the dynamics of the unconscious. And there's another old saying, the truth will set you free. And I think that's what she's saying here, effectively, that if, if there is a dynamic unconscious, if your conscious awareness, if your thought process is not all there is, if down below that there is a profound and deep unconscious, and I don't know any thinker today in my field who doubts that for a minute, they may argue about how it's put together, they may argue about what's in it, they may argue about how to affect it, but I know of, of no literature in any of the various theories of psychology that are going to categorically deny the presence of, of a powerful dynamic unconscious. And so I think what she's saying here is, and she's asking the question overtly, does self-knowledge lead to what she calls a natural morality? And I thought that was a profound question. I think what that means is that if we can get to the truth of the human mind, if we can get to the truth of, of the necessities of child development, then we have profound truth that seems to be directly applicable to human life across the board. She's suggesting here that every social problem has its core in the human psyche, and that war and anyone's achievement 
require the efficient management of aggression motivated with sexuality. That one of the most startling, revel I can't call it anything but a revelation uh, in, my, in my field, in my studies, in, in my own personal sort of uh, review of this literature, in my own therapy and my own work with patients, has been the realization that child development sits side by side with social psychology. That if you understand a child's mind, if you understand the primitive anxieties of children, then it is not a stretch to see the dynamic, the almost sometimes psychotic anxieties managed in groups being activated as some kind of sum total of the projected processes of the individuals in these groups. You, that sounds like a lot of technical jargon, but you know people do crazy things in groups. Everybody knows that. People will do things in groups they would never do by themselves. This explains it. This goes a long way toward explaining it, I think. I will give a separate lecture way down the road on social psychology, but another reason to pay attention to child development is not just because child development is important to raise children, though that may be the main reason. It gives us insight into the human condition. It gives us insight into what's right and wrong. It gives us insight, I think, with just very little stretching in, into our national political system. Why people do the things they do, you see it every day on the news or read about it on the web. It can be, it, I don't know if it can be made sense of, it can be made more sense of if these child development dynamics are kept in mind. You know that people as adults and teenagers have to comport, adapt, to society. We don't like it. It frustrates us. Uh, it, f it often feels inhibiting. It feels like we, we can't do what we authentically want to do because society has all these rules around us. Guess what? If you chafe against that, imagine a child who must, in exactly the same way, modify itself based on the family dynamics within which it is thrown. It didn't have any choice into, into what family to, to go into. The child will adapt to the family in the same way adults have to adapt to society. So the goal there, if you chafe at society's rules, then you must have some empathy for a child. And if you can shift your focus from the rules, be they traditional or scientific, to a focus on what this child needs for advancement, for development, then you might actually Un come to understand how your, you yourself can better develop your own potential in the society that you're in. Okay, next point. The mother's spontaneous emotional relationship to her child is primary. All other conscious planning is secondary. Now, I, let me say that again. A mother's spontaneous emotional relationship to her child is primary. That means that it is not what the mother does. It is not the mother's desire. It is not the mother's experience that counts in terms of the quality of her mothering. It really is her entire personality. And, and I think it's a slight misunderstanding, excuse me, to say spontaneous, because the mother's response to the child as a total response is a direct derivative, inevitably, of her own development. It is her entire personality that counts for the, to the baby, the whole person emotionally. And this is the key point, not the crystallized virtues of adult character. You might be a good person. You might be a trustworthy person. You might, you might follow all the values of the Boy Scouts, obey all the Ten Commandments, obey all the other rules, be a good upstanding citizen, and be a terrible parent. The cultural values that make good people do not necessarily translate into quality maternal and paternal care. Is this person empathic? Do they, have they worked through their own character development toward what we will come to see as a whole object sense of self? Are they strong, not rigid, are they strong characters themselves who can provide a sense of containment for the child's anxiety. And I think this, this next one will ring true to most people. It isn't what the parent says. It isn't what they do. 
It's not your values or your morality or I dare say your religion. It is not your socioeconomic standing that matters to the baby at all. It is who we are that matters to the baby. It is the fact that we are healthy and whole and deeply aware of our own dynamics and have done the developmental work necessary in ourselves to provide for the child's welfare. If that hasn't happened, the parents' remaining developmental angers, resentments, anxieties will inevitably be presented to the child, will, will be repeated in the presence of the child. The child will take those in and the stuff rolls downhill, unfortunately. And I, th I think it's true that the child knows the mother better than the mother knows herself. Children are emotional radar detectors. Children's lives depend on sometimes how attuned they are to the mother's moods. Moods which very often the mother isn't even aware of at a conscious level. That means that if the mother isn't healthy, the child will accommodate to the mother's neurosis. That derails development for the child. Here's a, here's a difficult one to highlight that an example. Most women, it seems, breastfeed their children. That's normal, that's natural, that's appropriate. If the mother doesn't like breastfeeding the child, if the mother is unable to, is it possible that that's coming out of the mother's own neurotic, unacknowledged, unrecognized aggression? Um, I had a patient once years ago. She had two sons and she could not breastfeed them. And we worked for a long time and it appeared at the end of our work uh, that she could not breastfeed them because unconsciously she hated them because they were men. And this was the, sad, the saddest part, that her internalized father was a hateful figure. And she was not aware, at the beginning at least, of how she projected that hatred of men onto her sons. And what was key to our work is that she had gotten pregnant a third time and had a daughter, and she had no problem breastfeeding the daughter. And it was that reality that I think startled her into an awareness that we had been getting close to through our work. There are biological reasons, but frequently in this field, they have emotional underpinnings. Here's, here's a more challenging and more painful possibility. Um, the author suggests that women who put their children in daycare too soon, too early, infants, toddlers, yet very young children, is, that, is, is it possible that that reflects an unconscious either anger or aggression toward the children by the mother? Most of the time, people justify that based on economics. Mother needs to go back to work quickly. The author suggests, I think, in a way that's both troubling and makes you think, that economics are just used to justify a pre-existing unconscious dynamic. I have had cases that seem similar to that. I've also had cases of legitimate economic need. But our goal is to always look underneath and to be honest, even when it's painful, about what's going on. And I think in this area, that's absolutely essential. And this, is, and this next part is the part that allows us to do that, I think, honestly and, and with some courage. There is, no, there is no blame and there is no judgment in this material. It may sound like it. It may feel like it if, if you think you've done something wrong. But the goal of this work is, is a, and here's the, the phrase that I want to, you to, to take away from today's lecture, benevolent curiosity and understanding. Do you have a benevolent curiosity toward your own mind? Can you? Do you have the strength and courage to take a look inside you as well as into the mind of your child and say, what does this child need? If you need to blame somebody, you got to go back to your parents, to the grandparents. H how far down that road can you go? Well, you end up either blaming Darwin or God, and that doesn't do anybody any good at all. So, no blame, no judgment, an attempt at honest and very courageous, benevolent curiosity, understanding, and a realization that we are ultimately responsible for the development of our children and responsible for our own lives. There's no one else to be responsible anymore. There's no one else 
to fix us besides us. So, if the parents have a stable and happy relationship, the parents will be, hopefully, most of the time on the same page. Everyone knows a child will play both, at both ends against the middle if there's conflict between the parents. If there's more than one child, the children must be handled equitably. There is great damage in the favorites, in the status of favorite child. The other children feel persecuted. The favorite child often feels more pressure than he or she can handle. The parents must try very hard to treat the children equitably. The ch children cannot be used as vehicles for the parents' narcissism. Parents who drive their children relentlessly into medical school because their mother and father were doctors or their doctors or some other career profession, whatever it is, without taking into honest consideration what this particular child's needs and developmental abilities are, are causing the child developmental problems which will come back to haunt them later on. There have been innumerable cases of children that get driven into one career only to sabotage it. Because here's the simple fact. A person's autonomy, their independence, their sense of themselves as efficacious is more important than, com than complying with the parents' demands, which the children mostly always see as the parents' issues and the parents' desires and the parents' narcissism, not their own desires. And children who get driven into one career or the other will always find a way to destroy it most of the time. And if they don't destroy it, they very often make themselves miserable in the process whose needs are being met in the, in the parents' driving of the children. You've all heard of the soccer mom or the little league dad screaming from the sidelines. This, is, this can't be called anything but narcissism on the, on the parents' uh, part. Okay, back to the nuts and bolts. Key issues. The other great innovation, seems like there's many great innovations, and I think that's true in the last 60 or 70 years, we must recognize that development has many stages, both physical and psychical, that neurologically we only develop by a predetermined genetic unfolding. You can't make the brain grow any faster than it does. Likewise, the emotions develop, and within very narrow limits, parents must have as Dr. Sharp says, an elasticity of adjustment. The parents must adjust to this particular child's developmental trajectory, both physiologically and emotionally. Do the parents want the child to develop its own potentialities, or do they simply want him to become an extension or fulfillment of their own ambitions and dreams? I mean, when, when you ask the question that way, the answer is obvious, and you can see in your own lives examples every day of people that get it right and the people that don't. Sharp's best recommendation, it seems to me, is to step back, respect the child's growth, respect their trajectory, and allow the natural rate of growth. That's what she, that's what she describes as the natural rate of growth. Do not hurry nature by damaging impingements, impingements. Don't try to force growth. Do not fr try to force compliance and achievement in areas beyond the physiological and emotional capabilities of the child. That will do damage. All right, so let's talk about some things to, do, to not do. What are the things that interfere with this or interrupts this orderly development? First, ex excessive stimulation of light or noise. I talked about this last time. A child's room and a home should be, a, especially a newborn, this is absolutely essential. The transition from prenatal to postnatal life must be smooth. It must be tra a transition with hardly any bumps. It's a terrible trauma for children to be born, it seems. The, the pain of childbirth is an astonishing thing. And so after birth, one hopes that the child's 
environment is as close to intrauterine life as possible. We keep them warm in soft clothes. We keep the lights low. We keep noises to a minimum. We keep them in the presence of their mother to the maximum extent possible. So number one, excessive stimulation of light and noise uh, interferes with development. Number two, the distraction of new people and their attentions. A newborn baby is not a circus sideshow. Are there going to be people who want to see you? Are there going to be grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles? Yes, and that's a wonderful thing. There is no question about that. But it, when, it, when it becomes a relatively consistent parade, when the child development, when their developmental process is derailed by this constant flux of, of difference in people and jostling and sounds, that the child's fragile mind, you can't even say mind yet, the the preliminary elements of a mind not yet taken together that is vulnerable to disruption so let grandma and grandpa aunts and uncles in and recognize the needs of the child for stable and consistent experience number three exaggerated parental efforts to evoke responses of affection or intelligence several years ago there was the baby mozart series of of uh, tapes out, which if you paid I don't know how much money, you would get these tapes that would help make, or baby Einstein tapes, I, I heard about those as well. They are all fraudulent, they do not work, they will damage your child if the, if the attitude of the parents, now there's nothing wrong with talking to your child, there's nothing wrong with letting your child listen to music, there's nothing wrong with letting your child listen to recorded voices in normal dis discussions probably nothing wrong with that at all but if the mother or father's attitude is that their children are going to be precocious they're going to know stuff they're going to be concert violinists they're going to be baby Einsteins the child's in a great deal of trouble that's the parents needs not the child's number four and this is I think a subset of, of three the urging of effort of any kind before the child can accomplish it fathers do not try to make your children walk before they can before they have the physiological ability to stand. You're asking for trouble, okay? Too frequent changes in environments before the child has mastered the previous ones. I think in our modern society, this is a constant source of parental failure. Kids are being handed off, different houses, apartments, environments, caretakers. The child is, is damaged by flux. Their little minds are filled with confusing flux as it is. Their little minds haven't come together yet. They need a stable environment and a present, consistent mother who's, who's always there as much as possible to help their fragmented mind come, come to some semblance of wholeness. Too strict adherence to rules for feeding and cleaning. We'll come back to this with Melanie Klein. I think this is one of the greatest failures of so-called science. Back at the end of World War II, the behaviorists came out with scientific schedules for feeding and sleeping and, and changing. And it was, I call it the fascist version of parenting. Uh, it was like these little, little jack boots on little babies. They're little, you, you want them marching or something. Babies may or may not be hungry at six o'clock. And if the baby is not hungry, uh, sticking a nipple in its mouth is not going to help. If the baby is hungry at five and you make it wait crying till six because that's what the scientists say is appropriate, then you're traumatizing the child. All right, we'll come back to this. A succession of different caretakers in charge is very damaging before the age of four or five. And again, some variations on a theme here. The child is unstable psychically and emotionally as well as physically, and must have a stable environment. And here's, here's what, that, what the, the caretaker change seems to do. The caretaker's temperaments, their emotional dynamics are different. Standards of behavior are different. The routines are bewildering and disintegrating to the infant. And it's already difficult enough for the infant even in a stable environment. So what you must realize is that it is the mind of the mother that is the container within which the mind of the baby comes together. A different mind is a different container. And the baby starts to form itself to the mother, gets handed off to someone else, and that vibe is very different. That resonance is very different. What they take in is often very, very different indeed. And the baby's development is derailed. 
And so is it good to have lots of people in the child's life that love it? I think so, yes. But we're talking here about handing off to numerous caretakers. Letting grandma hold baby for a while is perfectly reasonable and inevitable and appropriate and, and good for development. What she's talking about here is the handing off of a baby or infant toddler to various caretakers that generate a kind of chaos inconsistent with mental development. Next uh, thing not to do. Allowing the child beyond some point to sleep in the parent's bedroom. We, we almost never talk about this because I think it's uncomfortable. But the simple truth is babies should not be in the room with the parents if the parents are having sexual intercourse, ever. I think that's a rule that makes sense. I think that make, that's a rule that makes sense in terms of the child's developmental needs. Being present during parental intercourse evokes tremendous anxiety and anger and may condition the child to reactive interference. Sleep is vital to a baby. Disturbance is always bad. And such jealousy-provoking disturbances are doubly so. I think what we have never appreciated until recently is that a baby, even a baby, certainly a young uh, toddler, is not capable of not reacting to parental intercourse. They hear things. They frequently see things. And if you don't think that the child has fantasies, not of an adult sexual nature, of course not, but they have their own and sometimes those are worse. Melanie Klein discovered a profound fact that the earliest childhood understandings of the sexual act in the fantasy world of very young children is that, the, is that what is happening is violent. And I have had consistent experience with that. Children do not understand. If they sneak into the parental bedroom, if they see something, their first emotional response is that something violent is happening between the parents. There is no developmental sequence where that can be a good thing. Not just the overtly seeing sexual intercourse, but the interruptions of sleep and what happens. There's some good argument, I think, that children who wake up with night terrors are often those night terrors sometimes are a derivative of the of the babies toddlers infants emotional response to being too present for parental intercourse i don't have any other way to say it don't do it it isn't good for the child figure out how to get your needs met without impinging on your child's your your baby's developmental progression um, I think uh, this last one probably isn't as serious a problem as it was several years ago or several decades ago. Any, inter any interference with bodily functioning that is too frequent or prolonged will set up psychological problems later in life. Uh, by that, the author means it used to be quite common to give infants and toddlers enemas to make sure that they were regular. It used to be quite common to do... Uh, washes of their nose or ears. It used to be quite common to, to do all kinds of examinations that seemed quite intrusive. Um, and I think the research is, is beyond doubt now that that kind of thing is damaging. It usually, again, uh, inevitably, says something about the parent's anxiety as opposed to the child's developmental needs. And I think the conclusion here is that the, the attempt to force the rate of growth and of ad adaptation to grown-up standards is always a mistake. This is where a little benevolent curiosity into our own needs is necessary if we're going to provide for the child. All right, um, a few other issues to think about and to balance. Do we want to control behavior or have a curiosity about the child's mind? Do we want obedience? Or do we want growth? Now, you, everyone's going to say that it isn't either or, and, and you're right. But I think the tendency for most parents is to, is to err on the side of, of discipline, of, of control of behaviors. And they take less time, less than perhaps they should, to wonder about the meaning of that behavior. Where is that coming from? What's going on in the child's mind that that behavior is reacting to? I think that question maintained in the forefront will go a long way towards solving most of the developmental problems. 
The next thing that seems to be a mistake on most parents' part is the assumption of ignorance and uh, the child's need to be taught. Uh, I think children are wonderfully curious and will explore and their minds are active and we have underappreciated their complexity for, for decades. And if you give them the benefit of the doubt, if you give them, if you assume that they really know a lot and your job is to foster their growth, foster their aliveness, then you will be less likely to give them a regimented schedule of things they have to do, of things they have to learn by a certain date or time, uh, which again, more about the parent's need than the child's. I have to say a few words about learning disorders and the one thing that I will only half jokingly say is that there's no such thing as learning disorders. I touched on this last time I think. There are only disorders of emotional context, learning, this alive exploration of the child's world will be a natural growth of containment, of taking in enough love. Learning disorders are cognitive disorders that are only possible if the emotional context has been disrupted. Learning disorders result from parental prohibitions and inhibitions resulting from the threat of emotional abandonment. If the parents are too rigid, if the parents are too prohibitive, if the parents do not foster the spontaneous gesture in the child, then what's taken in by the child is an inhibition against learning. Their curiosity, their natural curiosity is stymied, is denied. And so they, they associate learning and creativity and their own spontaneous creativity with parental punishment, abandonment. And there's where, that is the core of virtually all learning disabilities, learning disorders. Um, Dr. Sharp considers breastfeeding the foundational act, and it's hard to argue with this. I, I, Melanie Klein agrees with this, that you don't have to breastfeed in order to be a good enough mother. I think everyone's in agreement on that. However, what you cannot do is pretend that bottle feeding is just as good, is equal to, especially when what is at stake is the emotional context of the experience for the child. The baby takes in so much more than mother's milk at the breast. The baby takes in the smell of the mother. The baby takes in the heartbeat of the, of the mother. The mother is present in a close, embodied, physical way. The rhythms of the mother's body are present. This all is the containing environment within which the child's mind forms. Without that, sticking a bottle in the child's mind and propping it up against the crib's wall simply is grossly inadequate as a substitute for that fully embodied experience. We have to keep in mind that the baby, in, the, in a baby's mind, there is no reality sense. There's no awareness of the self as a whole embodied self or person. There's no understanding of the mother as an other separate person. The baby's mind is an incredibly complex mix, but it's not reality based. There's no baby is going, Mother, good morning. Glad you're here. Nice dress. Really looking good today, Mom, at three months old. Not going to happen. Okay? The baby's vision is fairly clear, we think, but the differential between self and other, between inside and outside, is very confusing for the baby. So everything the mother can do to contain that experience and foster an internalization of a whole self is necessary. And I think it's correct to call breastfeeding the foundational act. Now, here, here's where we get into the more complicated part. If it's true that in a baby's mind, this sort of chaos has all of the primary emotions in it already, and, and in some intuitive way, I think we all understand this, a five-year-old can be very angry. A five-year-old can love, can hate, especially their little sister or brother. A, a five-year-old can be envious or desire or hate or have guilt or be aggressive or rage. Everyone gets that a five-year-old can have all of those emotions. Well, where do they come from? At what point did that five-year-old get them? And the answer of virtually all of the infant development researchers is they always had them. They, don't, they didn't get them at age two. 
They didn't get them at age, age 18 months. They didn't get them as soon as they could stand up. They came into this world with them when they were born, and frankly, the prenatal researchers are suggesting they, they were there before birth. This is one of the most painful things for, for new parents, uh, and perhaps old parents, to understand that in, the, in every baby's mind are all of these intense emotions. It is hard, therefore, without a fully functional mind, the way adults have. Look, <laughs> intuitively, you should understand this. When, when you, as an adult, get angry, get frustrated, get envious, get jealous, it's hard for you to behave appropriately. How much more difficult for a baby with no mind to speak of in the way we normally think of it in the adult way, to contain these, these uncontainable emotions. That is the function of the parental presence. That is the function of the stable household. That is the function of the love of the parents, to help the baby learn how to contain those, to take in enough love to be able to manage these terribly aggressive, difficult emotions. Um, Dr. Sharp and, uh, and Melanie Klein are in complete agreement on the primacy of sexuality in infancy. And this was not something they came up with. This was something Freud came up with in 1905. It was the most troubling, the most problematic, the most controversial of all of his discoveries. And on this one, at least, Freud has been proven completely right. And matter of fact, uh, probably didn't go far enough. Um, let me read one section. Sexual development begins in infancy, not at adolescence. The discovery of this was hindered by fear in the past, and fear makes many blind today. But Freud's original discovery concerning infantile sexuality has been proved beyond all question. Genital sensations, erection in the male and vaginal excitement in the female, occur in infancy only by the retention of and development of the early sexual orientation in male and female will biological and psychical maturity be attained. Vicissitudes, variances, in development that lead to diminution or too great a repression of the sexual instinct or change in its aim will cripple and deform in later life. I've never read a better quote. It equates effectively identity and sexuality. You don't have a sex life. You are alive as a sexual creature and it starts at birth. Let me read this other section. It is the psychical manifestation of sexual energy in sublimation to which we owe civilization. And the important thing to realize is that it is not repression of this energy, but utilization of it, which will make a child interested in the external world. This is the take home lesson here, that it is inevitably sexualized curiosity involving the baby and the mother's body, the fantasies of some kind of physical connection, the fantasies of embodied experience that are pleasurable, that are the precursors of adult sexuality. Get and recognize the child's sexual development from birth on, and you have a good chance of raising a healthy adult male or female. Get it wrong, and we're in trouble. Um, this is where we run into conflict with a, a large number of folks religious and traditional moralities. The problem is the research suggests that virtually any mental illness is in some form a sexual dysfunction. And it isn't surprising if we are fundamentally sexual creatures. If the evolutionary thinkers and the classical Freudians and most of the modern biologists and geneticists are right because they're all in agreement that we are fundamentally sexual and aggressive creatures. Those are the two primary drives within us and they, were, they are within us at the genetic level. Either God put us here that way or we evolved that way, it doesn't matter. We are sexual and aggressive creatures from jump and the management of that is going to be one of the most important um, measures of parental success with the children. I think learning disorders are always tied to parental overreaction for the sexuality and sexual curiosity of children. That is the child's first curiosity, the mother's body. The child will play, will look at 
at some point fairly directly. We'll play with the mother's ears, nose, lips, chin. We'll play, we'll have a little play with the nipple before feeding or during. They will stop a feed and play with the breast. They're curious about what's going on in there and they have fantasies to back it up. These are of a very primitive, erotic nature. Now, the biggest confusion I get in this area, students rebel against the idea that infants, toddlers, young children have any kind of sexual ideas at all. And I want to be very, very clear about this. I think, again, children do not think about sex the way adults do. But they have an erotic component in their fantasies that cannot be called anything other than erotic. And if it isn't dealt with, if you attempt to punish it, if you attempt to repress it or deny it, the child's intellectual, emotional, and sexual development will be derailed and sometimes quite significantly. It is the anxiety or punishing parental attitudes that generates perversions and sexual inhibitions. The good news, that sexual energy can be channeled, can, that curiosity can be fostered, that growth can be enhanced. Do you, it's a little like, I'm going to use the example from Aikido. Aikido masters do not stop force with frontal assaults or frontal force. They redirect it. They move it to the side. They move it in the direction they want it to go, using its energy in some ways against the opponent, but in this case, using the energy in the child, using the sexual energy, channeling that in productive, creative ways. Not inhibiting it, not punishing it, not repressing it. <clears throat> and what happens when you get frustrated? If the child has some kind of erotic, some kind of primitive erotic sexual desire and curiosity and they try to foster it and it gets stopped, what happens when you have a desire that gets stopped? You get frustrated. What happens in frustration? Frustration inevitably has a relational component. If I'm frustrated, it's because you're holding something back from me. Children feel the same and they get into a situation where the parents, through their inhibitions, are making the child angry, are making this child afraid. Anger at the parents is a dangerous thing. Sometimes that anger comes back at the child. That's called depression. Freud was right in 1917. Most depressions are simply childhood experiences of loss that generate anger that has nowhere to go because of the impossibility of being angry at your parents and that anger turns back against the the child self and that is the core and source of virtually all depressions perversions sexual inhibition sexual disorders are fairly described as erotically evoked hatreds bound to inappropriately sexualized objects you can't stop sexuality folks you can't stop it it's going to go somewhere. You can either foster it in healthy directions or you can, in your anxiety, in your rigidness, in your own revulsion toward your own sexuality perhaps, stymie it. It's going to come out somewhere and never in a good direction. I, I, think, I think the literature will support this next subject. If you look at the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, there is an entire section on sexual dysfunction. There is none of those sexual dysfunctions now recognized by virtually everyone in, the, in my community, certainly recognized as the core of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the universally accepted list of psychopathologies. There isn't a single one of them that has any biological basis. There is none of the sexual disorders that have anything to do with a brain chemistry imbalance. Without exception, sexual disorders are disorders developed in the matrix of a maternal and paternal family where sexuality was somehow inhibited, repressed, denied, or punished. Sexual perverts aren't born, they are made. And everyone's sexual dysfunction can find its source in those prohibitions and denials of childhood development. We can do better. The conclusion that Sharp comes to is, all conscious planning is of secondary importance to the environment provided by the parents' own emotional responses, subjective biases and prejudices. 
upon their ability to recognize these and so control and modify their own anxieties depends the success of any plan, however seemingly wise and rational in conscious intent. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Your good intentions, your desire, your, your hopes for your children are not going to help the children develop appropriately. What are the needs of the child and do you have the ability to contain your own anxieties so that you can in fact help the child develop through their own? She lists a series of fundamental considerations to, uh, to wind this up. Any, okay, any, and any consciously adopted plan for upbringing needs to be based on the following fundamental considerations. Every child has an individual tempo of growth and coordination, and to interfere with this or to hinder natural growth, to retard or accelerate, is equally harmful. The environment must, be must not be changed too frequently. The freer from anxiety the suckling period, and the more skillful the handling of anxiety attacks in this period, the better the foundation for the child's life. This means, quite simply, that the earlier periods are critical, the earliest periods of a child's life prenatal and immediately after birth and let's say to at least one or two years are the absolute critical most vulnerable periods. All activity of a happy nature is itself the utilization of sexual power. Therefore do not be stern or repressive. Do not use threats overt or implied concerning the child's sexual activity. The libidinal drive brings richness and fulfillment to existence. Again, a poetic way of saying that sexuality is life and that without a fulfilling sexual life, how can life be great? I think they're recognizing that as a truth and recognizing the truth that it begins very, very, very early, regardless of how that makes us uncomfortable. Respect the child's mind and its needs to pass through stages that are parallel to and intertwined with bodily development. Parents should be able to recognize what constitutes a psychical trauma. If your child is upset, you must address the psychical trauma, the fantasy that's going on in the child's mind. Don't let the child just sit there and cry it out. There's something terrible happening in their mind. They're terrified, they're angry, they're afraid. It must be addressed as a psychical trauma, not just, oh, you're being silly, I you, know, you didn't need that teddy bear anyway. That's traumatic to the child, and the parent better get a handle on their own inability to see that. My, one of my favorites is this, aggression is normal. Goodness or badness depends on the child's development, not the parent's convenience. I love that part. Is the child being good because it's obedient? Or is it very, very pathological? It's not whether they're good or bad. It's the meaning and the psychic meaning of that behavior. A child acting out against inappropriate parental dynamics is probably trying to foster its own growth appropriately. A child who submits politely and goes along with every detail is probably quite distressed and in some grave developmental difficulties. Finally, the absolute reliability of the parental figures is the child's mainstay through all its own changing world. His great need in early years is that his own emotional adjustments should be made within a stable and secure environment, not a cast iron and rigid one, but one in which there is an orderly life dictated by unfailing love and implicit faith. I think that's the best part of it. And that to do that right is an immense and rewarding responsibility. There's no blame. There's no judgment here. There is profound and immense responsibility. If we have benevolent curiosity about our own reactions first and then turn that more reality-based curiosity toward our children's growth, we will execute that responsibility well and our children will benefit from it dramatically and we will one day hopefully be able to bounce our grandchildren on our knee and see the smile on their face. Thank you very much. <laughs>